thank you for the introduction and thank you for attending the last talk <laughs> or on the day. So uh, today I will talk about how we can solve the DRAM scaling problem. And first I will start with a high level overview of our system. So in our current system, we have storage for persistent data and we have the processor which is operating on that data. But as storage, our disk is very slow, in between the processor and storage, we have main memory built with DRAM uh, so that the processor can access some data uh, buffered in memory. So <laughs> DRAM is actually pretty critical for gaining performance. And it's becoming even more critical because of all these data intensive applications. So we have all these high performance computing applications such as uh, DNA analysis. We also have all these sensors and cameras all over the place which are streaming a lot of data where we have to analyze uh, those. And we also have these new applications where uh, there is real time constraint on how we do our computation. And most of these applications, they depend on these in-memory uh, infrastructure where uh, most of the working state is stored in memory so that we can avoid accessing the disk. Uh, in, so there is an increasing demand for high capacity, high performance, energy efficient main memory. So how did we get uh, more capacity on our DRAM over the past few decades? Uh, here I'm showing uh, the year of production and in the y-axis I'm showing the capacity of the chips. So DRAM capacity used to double every 1.5 years, but it has slowed down and now the capacity is doubling every three years. So definitely scaling is getting difficult. But and this is due to the fact that once we are making the cell smaller, it is getting very difficult to manufacture these cells uh, reliably. Um, so low cost, and um, also achieving reliability. These two are getting, uh, achieving both of them simultaneously is getting difficult. But you can ask that, why is that the case? And in order to answer that question, uh, we will take a look at one DRAM cell. So here I will show the logical view of a DRAM cell and also the vertical cross section. So the first thing we need to know is DRAM uh, stores data uh, as a capacitor and the charge within the capacitor represents data value zero or one. And this capacitor is connected to a transistor which acts as a switch and that transistor is connected to a wire called bit line. So if we want to access the DRAM cell, we turn on the transistor and sense the charge in the capacitor through the bit line. The next thing that we need to know about DRAM cell is that charge leaks over time. So DRAM cells need to be refreshed every 64 millisecond to make sure that we don't lose our data. Now this amount of charge in the cell, it is actually directly correlated to the reliability of DRAM cells. Retention time is the time that we can still access a cell reliably. So if for some reason uh, our, uh, our refresh interval is, uh, if our retention time is greater than the refresh interval, that means that whenever we are accessing, accessing a cell, we can still read out the data. But if for some reason, the capacitor is leaking faster or for some, uh, due to some process variation, the cell just contains less amount of charge, it could happen that the retention time of the cell is less than the refresh interval. And in that case, the cell cannot retain its data. 
So the conclusion here is failure is de dependent on the amount of charge in the cells. And that leads to this uh, problem we face in the scaling that the cells interfere with each other. So DRAM has this cell-to-cell uh, -cell interference where there is, an, there is this indirect path between the neighboring cells and the neighboring cells can affect the amount of charge uh, within the neighborhood. So this has been a problem from the first manufactured DRAM. But the challenge is once we are making the cells more and more smaller, it is getting easier to uh, impact the neighboring cells. And the more interference is resulting into more failures. So what's the consequence of this? The consequence is it's getting very difficult to contain DRAM failures during the manufacturing time. So these are studies done in the, in, um, in industry and national labs, which show that um, around 1.5% of the DRAM is failing uh, in their data centers. Uh, this one, this is a slightly newer study, which shows that there are almost twice six more failures when we are using a newer generation of chips. So the goal of my work is I want to enable high capacity, low latency memory, but without sacrificing reliability. So how can we achieve that? Um, we can try to make DRAM scalable. That's one solution. Uh, we should also try to uh, leverage the new technologies which are predicted to be more scalable because they don't rely on uh, capacitors. And we, could, we should also try to look at applications where we can tolerate more and more failures. But in this talk, I will uh, mainly talk, discuss that how we can make DRAM scalable using some system level detection and mitigation techniques. So let's take a look at that. So how, do, how ha have we been getting more capacity over the years? So what DRAM vendors are doing is after they manufacture the chips, they go through extensive testing and when they find some cells that are failing, uh, they try to repair a small fraction of the cells or they mostly discard the um, chips that are failing. So when we get the chips, the DRAM chips in the field, uh, there is this guarantee from the manufacturers that uh, most likely uh, it is operating correctly. So this guarantee is coming from the vendors. And in my work, I'm proposing that maybe we can ship that guarantee from the manufacturer to the system. So what I mean by that is the DRAM vendors, we have, they won't test their chips that extensively. So when they ship the DRAM chips, some of them will fail. But uh, when we plug in our DRAM, then it will be the responsibility of the system to detect and mitigate the failures. And by system, I mean that it would be the responsibility of the operating system and memory controller to provide the reliability guarantee. And because this is happening in the field while the applications are already running, uh, we call this as an online profiling system. So what's the benefit? The first benefit, I already talked about it. Uh, it improves yield, reduces the cost, and enables scaling. But there is actually uh, a performance and energy benefit too. How is that? So when we think about DRAM cells, uh, if all the cells were of the same size, they would have uh, contained uh, same amount of charge. But in reality, um, DRAM has significant variation in the cell size, which means that they contain different amount of charge. 
So that leads to variation in their retention time. So some cells, or actually most of the cells, they have a very large retention time, uh, and Andreas was already talking about it. But then there are uh, some small number of cells uh, they, which will actually uh, would leak very fast. So what we can do is, if we can detect the cells that are leaking faster, we can use high refresh for those. But for the rest of the cells, we can use uh, lower refresh rate and reduce the number of total refresh that we will need in the system. And re as refresh is the main bottleneck uh, in, um, it, it's a significant bottleneck for DRAM um, that actually leads to significant performance and energy efficiency. So the, all these optimization, they depend on uh, accurately detecting these failures. And the problem would have been uh, an easy problem if all these failures were permanent. We would have boot up the system, go through all memory cells, figure out which one is failing, which one are not, and we would have been done. But the problem is these DRAM failures uh, are intermittent. And uh, one of uh, the intermittent failures, which is very significant, that's I already talked about it in the cell-to-cell -cell interference failure. So this is called a data-dependent failure, where some cells are failing depending on the data stored in the neighboring cells. So it could happen that uh, we wrote 111 in some cells and there is no failure, but when we are writing 010, because of these interference, that, that cell starts failing. So how can we detect these failures at the system level? So I will talk about how if we come up with or if we use some testing techniques, what would be the efficacy of these detecting this intermittent failure, and I will briefly talk about how we can improve upon that. So in order to detect the efficacy of testing technique, we have used this FPGA-based infrastructure where we have tested more than hundreds of chips from three different vendors. Uh, this is how it looks like. Uh, so what we want to know is if we test our chips, how uh, can we detect the failing cells? And in order to do that, the mechanism is pretty simple. Write some pattern in the module, uh, wait until the refresh interval because we want to make sure that the cells have the lowest amount of charge when the interference has the highest impact. And then we read back the value and try to see if the values match. And we have done it for many different data patterns. So what's the result? Here I'm showing the number of rounds of test in the x-axis and the number of cumulative failures uh, with, uh, with some number of rounds of test. So basically it says that how many unique failures we have seen so far with uh, x number of rounds. <laughs> So what we found that if we test with some uh, static patterns, like all ones, all zeros, alternative zeros and ones, we find we detect some failures. But when we use random patterns, we actually uh, we are able to find many more failures. And even after hundreds of rounds of tests, we see small number of new cells that keep failing. So the conclusion here is even with testing many rounds of tests, we cannot detect all the failures. So now the question is like why? Like we know how data dependent failures work. If I know there is this, if I want to test this cell at address X, I should write some data pattern in the neighboring cells and I should be able to know if that cell D fails or not. 
But unfortunately, uh, this is no, not how DRAM cells are mapped. So what DRAM vendors do is they internally scramble that space. <laughs> so the, the, uh, the system, which um, at the system level, whatever uh, addresses that we see in sequence, that does not correlate to physically adjacent cells. So it could happen that the sequential addresses, they correlate to cells which are far apart, where the neighboring cells will have very different addresses. And to make things even worse, this mapping is not exposed to the system. So I want to detect data dependent failures, but I even don't know the mapping of the cells. So I came up with a DRAM internal independent detection technique where we basically change how we do the testing. So, so far, what we say that there would be two phases of in the detection. Uh, the system would start and do some initial testing and once it has detected and mitigated all the failures, only after that we will start um, executing our application. So if this is our memory cell, we will try to detect all the failures and only after that we start executing. But the problem is we don't know the mapping, so we don't know all the cells that are failing. So in this work, what we propose that maybe we don't have to uh, detect all the failing cells. So if some application is running in our system, it has some content in the memory, and that content will have some data dependent failures. We only need to know which, which bits are failing with that content. So basically we are saying that we will uh, do simultaneous detection and execution instead of exhaustively testing for all failures. So at the high level, there is no detection or mitigation. We will start running the application with a very high refresh rate. But once the application start running, we will do the testing with the current content. And if there is no failure found, we will use a low refresh rate. So to summarize, detection at the system level is challenging due to these data dependent failures, but it is possible to detect and mitigate these failures simultaneously when the program is uh, executing. And I didn't show the results, but it, it provides us a significant uh, benefit in, by reducing the number of refreshes. So with that, I will finish and I would be happy to answer the questions. We have time for just one question, maybe? Yes. Hello, Simon Moore, University of mm -hmm. Cambridge. Um, I just wonder if there are implications from a security point of view. Obviously, we have problems with Rohammer and so on. And using these sort of techniques, do you, uh, can you mitigate Rohammer because you can spot it happening? or? Can I mitigate Rohammer by using some system level detection? Yeah, or uh, or will or by going down this route, are you mm -hmm. more susceptible to Rohammer because you may have more cells that are susceptible? So the Rohammer interference is more like in two different rows, where this is within a row. So this is kind of orthogonal, but we could come up with testing techniques where it will detect the rows which are susceptible to row hammer. Uh, but again, the mapping is actually not exposed to the outside. So it, we have to do some kind of exhaustive testing to figure out which rows are susceptible. Right. Unfortunately, we run out of time. Uh -huh. Let, let's thank uh, uh, Samira once again.